Hi, in this video, I'm going to go through um, the AQA AS, <coughs> AS level chemistry paper, um, paper one. And this is the paper from 20, um, this is the 2018 paper. Okay. I should have chopped that bit off, but that's the one it was. Okay. Um, right. Uh, question about atomic structure. Uh, in the 19th century, J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. He suggested negative electrons were found, uh, and that's one like plums in a pudding of positive charge. That's number 1.1 1 .1 state. Two differences between the plum pudding model and the model of the atomic structures today. Well, uh, it's pretty obvious, really, isn't it? The um, it's kind of GCSE question. The uh, positive charge is found concentrated in the nucleus. Um, I wouldn't say the, uh, uh, I would avoid saying protons there because, of course, they didn't, uh, well, protons were discovered later on. Positive charge is concentrated in the nucleus, and um, now we know the electrons are in orbits, orbitals around the nucleus, outside of the nucleus. Right, the electro deduce the electronic configuration of elements. Oh, well, if you look in there, it's got seven electrons. Uh, it's in a neutral atom. Look in your periodic table. That would mean it would be nitrogen. So it's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. Okay, uh, identify R. So R is nitrogen. Uh, and deduce the form of the compound form when R reacts with the group two metal in the same period. So we look at the group two metal in period two, do a periodic table, that is beryllium. Um, now beryllium is probably gonna form Be2 plus iron. The nitrogen is gonna form the N3 minus iron if it did form an ionic compound. And so the formula would be Be3N2. Okay, question about sodium fluoride. Toothpaste contains sodium fluoride. The concentration can be expressed in this PPM, okay? So PPM, it tells us here, it's quite handy, is the same thing as one, one PPM is the same as one milligram in a kilogram of toothpaste. A one gram sample of toothpaste was compound that many moles, okay? We've got to calculate the concentration of PPM of sodium fluoride in ppm uh, so how do we do that right so we've got the moles so we need to work out the mass of sodium fluoride first so the mass of naf so the moles multiplied by the mr the mr of sodium fluoride is 23 for sodium 19 for um fluorine so that is uh 42 so 2.88 times 10 to the minus five multiplied by 42. That's going to give us the mass in grams, which is 1.2096 times 10 to the minus three grams. But we want to work this in out in PPM. So we want to find out um, uh, how much is in a kilogram, okay? So that's that's grams of NAF in one gram of toothpaste. So therefore in a kilogram, multiply that by a thousand, that's gonna be equal to 1.2096 grams. Uh, but we need to convert into milligrams per kilograms. Okay, that's in a kilogram to give us in PPM. So multiplied by a thousand to give us in milligrams, that gives us uh, 1,209.6 uh, milligrams in a kilogram. So let's give that to uh, three significant figures. In PPM, it would be uh, one, two, uh, one, zero PPM.
Okay, so uh, the next bit, question. Right, sodium fluoride is toxic in high concentrations. Uh, right, you mustn't allow the concentration to get higher than 3.19 times since month two grams per kilogram. Deduce the maximum mass of sodium fluoride in milligrams that a 75 kilogram person could swallow. Okay, right, so that would be, uh, they can have that much per kilogram. So they weigh 75 kilograms, it'd be 75 times like that. And that is equal to 2.3925 grams. So uh, we want it in milligrams multiplied by a thousand. I'll give it to three significant figures. That is going to be uh, 2.2390 milligrams. So that's the maximum milligrams that they could, uh, of, of sodium fluoride. So we need that in the next part of the question. So the next part of the question here, oh, the next part of the question asks us, um, what is the uh, maximum mass of toothpaste that the person could swallow? A maximum mass of toothpaste. And it says the toothpaste has got a concentration of 2,800 ppm. Okay, so that we, we know is equal to 2,800 milligrams per kilogram. Right, so they can have a ma mass maximum amount of that many milligrams. So therefore the maximum mass of toothpaste they could swallow In kilograms is going to be 2,300 the maximum they could, be, uh, they could eat divided by the concentration in the toothpaste 2,800 that gives us an answer of 0.854 kilograms of toothpaste quite a lot of toothpaste okay Right, on to the sizes of ions. Identify the diagram that shows the correct sizes of the ions in sodium fluoride. Well, sodium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. So the sodium ion is going to be uh, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Fluoride, the fluoride ion, Right, fluorine is 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. So the fluoride ion actually has the same electronic configuration as the sodium ion. Okay, so they've got the same electronic configuration, but they're not the same size because if you look in the periodic table, um, sodium has got 11 protons in the nucleus, whereas fluorine has only got nine protons. So the fluorine fluoride ion that is going to be bigger because the positive pull of the nucleus is weaker so the um, sodium is going to be smaller so b is the correct uh, answer there you probably didn't have to mention the full electronic structure there just to say they've got the same electronic structure would probably be fine okay right Right, okay, here's a calculation then. Okay, a student heated some hydrated sodium carbonate for one minute to remove the water. Okay, uh, and they give us the mass before and after there. And use the data in the table to calculate the value for X in the formula. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna write down there, the, what happens when you heat that, you're gonna get to sodium carbonate XH2O is going to give us sodium anhydrous sodium carbonate solid. Let's put solid there. 
and we're going to get x moles of water. So it's important to realize here that one mole of the hydrated sodium carbonate is going to give us one mole of sodium carbonate. Right, now we can work out the mass. Uh, this is the mass of the solid before heating. So that's going to be the hydrated stuff. So we have to subtract the mass of the empty basin from that. So let's write down the mass of the hydrated stuff. So that's before heating. Subtract that from that, you get 1.12 grams. And then let's do the mass of the anhydrous stuff. This is after heating. So we've got to subtract, subtract the empty weighing uh, evaporating basin from the the mass of the evaporating basin at the end, do that, and you get 0.57 grams. Right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to calculate the moles of something, and we're going to use moles is equal to mass over MR. Can we work out the moles of this? We can't because we don't know the MR of that because we don't know what the value of X is. But we can work out the moles of the sodium carbonate because we know the MR of that, and then that will give us the moles of that. So let's do that. Okay, so okay. let's write down moles of sodium carbonate anhydrous. Mass over MR. The MR of that, to work it out, is 106. So that's 0 0.57 over 106, which gives us 5.377 times 10 to the minus 3. So we can deduce from that that we have got that many moles of the hydrated stuff as well. So let's write that down in the next line. So moles of the hydrated. is the same. Now we're going to use that to work out the MR of this hydrated stuff. So MR is equal to mm, uh, mass over moles. Uh, and the mass of the hydrated stuff we worked it out was 1.12 grams divided by the number of moles, 5.377 times 10 to the minus three. And that gives us a value of 208. Okay, so I'm gonna go over here now. So now we know the sodium carbonate the MR, the overall MR, the whole thing, we've calculated it to be 108, 208, sorry. And we said before, the, the mass of that bit there, that adds up to 106. So the XH2O bit, it's got to be, um, sorry, that's 208, sorry. Uh, 208 minus 106, which is equal to um, uh, 102. One molecule of water weighs 18, so X is going to be equal to 102 over 18. And that gives us a value there of 5.68. So that's not very satisfactory because we know it's got to be a whole number value. And that's almost halfway between 5 and 6. So that I think later on it tells us this experiment hasn't worked, but that is the answer that we get. Okay, 5.68 for the value of X, which is there's a mistake with the experimental design. Right, yeah, it says the correct value for this is 10. Suggest a reason for the difference between the experimental value and the correct value. Right. The most likely explanation for this, when you're doing these sort of experiments, is they, they said they only heated it for a minute. They didn't heat for long enough. So 
So not all of the water was lost. There's still some water in the sample. Okay, now how could you uh, improve the procedure to give a more accurate value for X? Well, this is a fairly standard technique and, and you should know this really, but you should heat to constant mass. So you should heat it and record the final mass, which was, what was the final mass? I'll just scroll up a bit. The final mass was um, 24.92, okay? So they got 24.92 the first time they did it. So they should heat it for a bit longer and weigh it again. Now, if they've got 20, if they've got something less than that, it means that it's still losing water from there to there. So they should heat it again. And then you should heat it a, and again until you eventually get the mass isn't decreasing anymore. And then you can be reasonably sure that you've got rid of all the water. So heat to constant mass, that is the way to do that. Okay, so this is a simple chemical test. Right, they've got three anhydrous sodium compounds, all right? And they're known to be sodium carbonate. So I'll write down the formulae. Sodium carbonate, sodium fluoride, and sodium chloride, and you don't know which one is which. So you've got to do a sequence of test tube reactions that you could carry out to identify those compounds. Right, now I think the first thing, the first thing I would do would be to heat the sodium carbonate, sorry, not heat it, is to add, add acid. Okay, any acid, but probably add nitric acid with all nitrates are all soluble. And if you've got a carbonate, you will get carbon dioxide gas will be evolved. So you'll see fizzing and you can test that it is carbon dioxide using lime water. Just bubble it through a bit of lime water, trap some in the pipette, bubble it through in lime water. And if it's carbon dioxide, it will turn it cloudy. Okay, so we need um, an equation including state symbols for reaction. Okay, so we've got sodium carbonate. You react a carbonate with an acid, you get a salt, which is in this case is sodium nitrate. You get carbon dioxide and you always get water. I need to, to put state symbols there. So we've got, right, this is solid, isn't it? This is aqueous. All nitrates are all soluble, so it's going to be aqueous. We've got a gas and a liquid, and we need to balance that. We've got two sodium, so we need to put a two there. And that means we've got to put two in front of the nitric acid, uh, which is good because then we've got those two hydrates, so that's all balanced. Okay, so you could eliminate which one was sodium carbonate. Uh, now, the next thing to do is you've now just got to distinguish which one of these is which, and that you can do that by using um, silver nitrate. You should really use acidified silver nitrate, uh, but if, it, if there's, just in case it's got any carbonate in there, but it doesn't really matter if it hasn't, well, it doesn't matter if you do, acidified, let's say acidified, AgNO3 aqueous, acidified with nitric acid. And when you add it to the chloride, you're going to get a precipitate of silver chloride, uh, because that's very insoluble, whereas silver fluoride is soluble, so you won't get a precipitate with silver fluoride. So let's write an equation for the reaction with silver uh, nitrate and sodium chloride. So we've got AgNO3, and that's an aqueous solution. And we're going to add, well, we can, let's, let's make the sodium chloride into a solution before we add it. So we're going to dissolve that in water. And we should get a precipitate of AgCl, so that's solid. And what is left over is going to be sodium nitrate, which is an aqueous solution. And they, you're going to determine the NaF just by process of elimination. There isn't really a test for fluoride, a simple test you check for fluoride, but you're just going to by elimination say it's not the carbonate, it's not the chloride, so it must be the fluoride.
Okay, now we've got a question about equilibrium. Sulfur so trioxide decomposes according to this equation here to make SO2 and oxygen. Right, the graph shows it. So what they do is they start off with SO3 and you haven't got any of the products and you heat it up and you allow some of it to react. Okay, so we can see here, it's not reached an equilibrium on this bit, but when, once the concentrations of things don't change, which is at three, that is when it's reached equilibrium because the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the backward reaction. I think it's gonna ask us when it reaches equilibrium. So state the time to the nearest minute when equilibrium was first established, or three minutes there when it goes horizontal, just after three minutes. Okay, so we're gonna say there for the explanation, uh, no change in concentrations of reactants or products. And that's because the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the backward reaction. That's what happens at equilibrium. Right, sketch on the graph how the concentration of SO2 changes over these six minutes, okay? Now we need the equation there because look, uh, to be careful because you know, SO2 is going to follow the, the oxygen pattern really, isn't it? Because it's a product. But every time we form one mole of oxygen, we're actually forming two moles of SO2. So the concentration of SO2 has got to be twice as high as the oxygen all the time. So do something like this. So the oxygen there is 0.3. So the SO, sorry, 0.15 at equilibrium here. So that's going to be at 0.3. That's going to be at 0.3 there. Um, that's at point three. Let's just do that point at point one. So the, the SO2 will be at point two there. Um, we've got a concentration of point zero five there. So the SO2 is going to be point one. So it's going to be something like that. Same shape, but sort of twice as high. Okay, the temperature of the mixture was changed to T2. Okay, uh, right. So what I'm gonna do is just paste that little bit of information there at the start of that question. Just the equation and there it tells us that it is an exothermic in the forward direction. So I've got that. There's the equation, and it tells us here the sulfur trioxide in this new temperature, um, the equilibrium concentration of sulfur trioxide. Is equal to 0 0.07 okay now. That's the SO3. If you look at our graph, the equilibrium concentration of the SO3 there was 0.1, it was higher, okay? So that's at T2. At T1, SO3 concentration is higher. So let's see what happens then. That means at T2, the equilibrium moves to the left to give more SO3. Uh, Sorry, T2, the equilibrium moves to the right. Uh, sorry, it moves to the left to give less SO2, yeah? SO3. Right, uh, now we know the backward reaction, the forward reaction is X, so the backward reaction, this is the, that must be, that's endothermic in the forward, so it's XO in the backward reaction. So to make it move in the exothermic direction, right, right, let's see. Start again, sorry about that. Right, 
a S, let's do it, a T2, the SO3 is lower. SO3 concentration at equilibrium is lower. So therefore, the equilibrium has moved left, so it's moved to the right, yeah, to give less SO3. So I is moved in the exo direction, in the endo direction. So that means T2 must be higher than T1. So if you do those statements like that, one, two, three, and four, that's a sort of logical progression. I think if you look in the marks, if you just say it's higher, you don't get any marks at all. Or um, you've got to give the explanation as well, because you've got a 50-50 chance of getting it right, I suppose. Right, now here is a, I'm going to use the ideal gas equation here to find out the relative molecular mass of an unknown volatile liquid. Okay, now the way they're going to do that is by, we're going to use PV is equal to NRT. We're going to work out the number of moles of gas by doing N is equal to PV over RT. We know the volume here, pressure they measure, we know the, okay, and then we're also going to use moles, a different color, moles is equal to mass over MR. That means MR is equal to mass divided by the number of moles, which we call N there. So we're going to substitute that value of N into there. The mass we're going to get from the uh, calculation, because they weighed the mass of the syringe with the liquid in it before and after. Okay, so we're going to get that there. We're going to work out the MR. Of course, this is a volatile liquid, so it's a liquid, but once it goes in here, it's hot, so it turns into a gas. So let's work out N, first of all, and we have to be really careful with units whenever we do the idea of gas equation. So P here, they've given it in kilopascals, that's got to be in pascals, so that's 102,000. Volume, you've got to be even more careful because volume must be in meters cubed, and one centimeter cubed is equal to a million, sorry, one meter cubed is equal to a million centimeters cubed. And what volume have we got here? The gas volume it tells us is 85 centimeters cubed. So we've got 85 centimeters cubed, which is equal to 85 times 10 to the minus six meters cubed. So that's the V value to go in the equation. So put that in there, 85 times 10 to the minus six. R is 8.31. And the absolute temperature, well, we've got 98.1 plus 273. That's going to be in Kelvins, and that gives us a value of um, 371.1 Kelvin. Right, work out the number of moles there, put the numbers into the calculator, and you get 2.81 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. Now we need to work out the mass of the liquid that we've added. So um, what we've got to do there is we've got to do uh, subtract the mass of the syringe before and afterwards. So we're going to subtract 10.7 from 10.9, that's equal to 0 0.21. Put it into our MR equation in green there, we get MR is equal to mass over the number of moles. So that's 0 0.21 grams divided by uh, this 2.81 times 10 to the minus three. And that gives us 74.7. That is the MR of our volatile liquid. That's the answer. So the main thing there is to be careful with your units, the idea of gas equation. Okay. Right. Uh, 
Okay, now some liquid uh, didn't evaporate because it dripped into the gas cylinder outside the oven. How would that affect the value of MR? Well, let's have a look at this then. Right, so we need to look at the ideal gas equation there. Right. Uh, that means the volume we measure is smaller than it should be. So that means that's going to make our value of N too small, smaller than it should be. And we use N later because we do MR is equal to the mass. That's going to be correct. Divided by N. Right, this value of N is going to be too small. So that means MR is going to be, we're going to make MR is going to be bigger than it really is. We're going to overestimate the value of MR. Okay, this is the last question, and I'm going to do the second half of the paper in, the, in another video. Uh, chlorine is used to decrease the numbers of microorganisms in water. When chlorine is added to water, you get this redox equation. Right, deduce the oxidation states of chlorine and the in those two compounds. Well, let's use this little formula. The sum, sigma, the sum of the oxidation number is equal to the charge on the species. Okay. Okay, so let's do HCl. The charge of the species is zero. Um, hydrogen has got a fixed oxidation of the plus one. Chlorine, we don't know. So that means Cl, rearrange that little algebra expression, is minus one in there. And let's do it in this HClO now. So same again, the charge on the species is zero. Hydrogen is plus one. Chlorine, we don't know. And oxygen is always minus two. So that gives us chlorine minus one is equal to zero. Chlorine is equal to plus one. Okay, that is the answer there. Give two half equations to show the oxidation and reduction processes that occur in this redox reaction. Okay, oxidation half equation. Well, the chlorine starts off at zero, doesn't it? And when it gets oxidized, it goes to plus one, plus the HClO. Okay, so let's do that. So we've got Cl2 goes to HClO. I've got a balance of the chlorine, so I'm going to put a two there. We could do a half on the other side, but that's fine doing it that way. Now let's balance all the oxygens with um, balance of the oxygens by adding water. So we're going to have to have two H2O here. Now we need to balance for um, hydrogens, well, we've got with H pluses, so we've got four hydrogens on this side and only two on the right, so we need two H plus there. Finally, balance for charges, we've got zero charge on the left, but we've got plus two on the right due to these, uh, due to the H pluses, so we're going to need two electrons there. The reduction half equation, well, we're going to have Cl2 and it goes to HCl. So again, balance that. No oxygens to balance for, we need to balance for hydrogen. So I want two H plus here. And uh, balance for charges, that means I need two electrons on that side. So there's the two half equations. Okay, chlorine is reacted with cold aqueous sodium hydroxide in the manufacture of bleach. Give an equation for this reaction between chlorine and so sodium hydroxide. Well, that's kind of on the specification. You need to just know that. So again, you get one of these disproportionation reactions. You get chlorine plus NaOH. Disproportionation gets oxidized and reduced simultaneously. Remember, it doesn't match this, but I'm just saying. So that's going to give you NaCl. The chlorine there has got an oxidation number of minus one. And you get sodium chlorate here. And the sodium and the, the chlorine's got an oxidation number of plus one. So one of the chlorines become reduced, one oxidized. Now to balance that, we're going to need two NaOHs. And then you can see you're going to have a water molecule on that side. And that's really kind of mostly recall that question. Okay. 
Right, the concentration of chlorate ions in bleach um, can be uh, can be estimated, uh, can be found by reactive iodide ions. So the overall reaction is chlorate plus uh, goes to iodine, okay? So a sample of bleach was found to contain chlorate ions with this concentration. They add potassium iodide to it for 20 centimeters cubed. So you've got to calculate the mass of potassium iodide needed. How much iodide do we need to add to make sure we react with all the bleach? Okay, so let's do moles of chlorate ions first. Is equal to the concentration times the volume. The concentration is 0 0.0109. And the volume is 20 centimeters cubed, so that's times 0 0.02 in dm cubed. That gives us a value of 2.18 times 10 to the minus 4 moles. And then we need to look at the ratio in the equation. So look, one mole of chlorate is going to need two moles of iodide. So let's do, therefore, the moles of iodide you're going to need are... So the moles of I minus, and hence Ki, the same, is going to be two times that, which is equal to 4.36 times 10 to the minus 4 moles. The MR of potassium iodide is equal to 39.1 for potassium, potassium plus 126.9 for the iodine, which is equal to 166. So the mass of stuff you're going to need, mass of Ki is equal to the moles times by the MR is equal to 4.36 times 10 to the minus 4 multiplied by 166. That gives us 0 0.0724 grams. Right, it needs, it's asking us to give our answer in milligrams and two appropriate number of significant figures. Well, we're going to give it to three sig figs because all our data is given to three sig. That's the three sig figs that is there. Okay, so multiply that by a thousand to give it in milligrams. That's going to give us 72.4 milligrams to three significant figures. All right. Finally, this question we've got Hess's law calculation. Potassium chlorate is used in fireworks. When it decomposes, it produces potassium chloride and oxygen. Give an equation for the decomposition. Well, it says it's going to be so we've got KClO4. Give potassium chloride and oxygen. Uh, so it's going to give us two options to balance it. That's gas, solid, and solid. Now use the data to calculate an enthalpy change for this reaction. Well, we're giving us delta H F data. So we always have to think what is the third thing we're going to put it down in our Hess's law cycle. Well, when it's delta H F, we put elements in the standard states. The elements in the standard states in this case are potassium solid, a half Cl2, and 2O2 gas. Now, it's enthalpy of formation, so we're forming these compounds from the elements, so the arrows are going to go up. Let's do that one in red. And that one in green. So the red arrow we're forming one mole of potassium chlorate, so that's minus four, three, four. The green arrow, we're forming one mole of potassium chloride, that's minus four, three, six. And two moles of oxygen, of course, that's no change there. The elements in the standard state, so ignore that. Right, so we want to find delta H for this reaction here. So delta H is equal to, right, the red value, we're going to reverse the sign because we're going to go against it. So that's plus four, three, four. In the green, we're going to stick with the minus sign because we're going with the arrow. So it's minus 436. 
So the answer there is uh, minus two kilojoules per mole. That's the answer there. Right, that is about halfway through the paper and I will continue the rest of it in the next video.